The year was 1984. I was eight years old and life was great. I had just successfully completed the third grade where I learned all sorts of new and interesting things like how to write in cursive and how to do multiplication. I had a really active social life. I had a bunch of friends that all lived in the neighborhood and we would get together and play every day after school. And in the summertime, we never missed an opportunity to ride our bikes around, to go out and play baseball, or to sometimes just spend a whole afternoon watching cartoons. It was a pretty idyllic childhood. So I didn't take it too well when my parents told me that we were moving. Now, by most objective measurements, the move was a big upgrade. My family was leaving the urban confines of Brooklyn, New York, and heading to a much cleaner, safer, and quieter suburban enclave in New Jersey. Our new, <laughs> <clears throat> Our new home was bigger. There was a backyard with a swimming pool. We even had cable television for the first time. Our town had acres and acres of untamed woods that I could run around and explore. Even my new school had a more inviting and friendlier name. I had been attending New York City Public School number 272. <laughs> my new school was named after the babbling brook that ran alongside it. But these objective measurements, these objective upgrades, they didn't matter much to an emotional eight-year-old. I was sad, I was lonely. I was having a hard time making friends and I missed my old friends. Making things worse, the first day of school was getting closer and closer. I was terrified about starting at a new school where I didn't know anyone, about having to do things that I had never done before, like get on a school bus. I was nervous and I was anxious. My parents recognized this and they tried to do what they could. They wound up doing what most parents in the 1980s did when their kids were struggling. They went shopping. <laughs> what my parents came up with though, the plan was actually quite clever. There was an article of clothing that I had really wanted for a really long time. My parents decided to buy it for me. They gave it to me and told me that this was something special for me to wear on the first day of school. The idea was that this garment would be something positive that I could focus on. It would replace the negative feelings, the anxiety and the stress that I was feeling about the first day. And it totally worked. I loved my new Michael Jackson jacket. And let me be clear so you know what I'm talking about. This was a replica of the jacket that Michael Jackson wore in the Thriller video. <laughs> it was a red jacket that had like a black V across the front of it. Not to be confused with the Billie Jean jacket that had a lot of shiny sequins all over it. And it was definitely not the Beat It video jacket that was also red but had a lot of like zippers and chain mail on it for some reason. This was the Thriller jacket, and to an eight-year-old kid who was obsessed with Michael Jackson, that was about as cool as it got. There was one catch, though. I wasn't allowed to wear it out until that first day. So I wore it around the house, and I practiced. I would gather, I would gather my school supplies, everything from that carefully curated list of the exact number of pens and pencils and glue sticks and markers and notebooks and pads and rulers and protractors and everything you were going to need for the school year. I'd put it all in my backpack, I'd put the jacket on, and I'd wander around the house practicing. <laughs> when the first day of school came, I was ready. Jacket on, backpack slung over my shoulder. I left the house with my mom, and she escorted me down the street to the school bus stop. Now, I had never been on a school bus before, but I understood the basics. You get on the bus, you find a seat, and it takes you to school. The bus arrived, I got on it, but all of a sudden, something was seriously wrong. I started walking down the aisle and I realized there were no seats. There was no space. No one was moving over and making room for me. I didn't know what to do. My heart started to beat really fast. My my breathing got shallow, my neck got hot, my face got red. I felt alone and adrift without a place to sit. And then I heard it coming from the back of the bus. From the back of the bus were the older kids, the 12 year olds, the cool kids, where they sat. Hey, Michael, why don't you moonwalk for us, Michael? Where's your white glove, Michael? Oh no, everything was spinning. I didn't know what to do. What was happening? Were they making fun of me and my sweet Michael Jackson jacket? <laughs> is it possible that Michael Jackson is not as cool in this part of the world as he was in Brooklyn, New York? <laughs> the panic was getting worse. I didn't know what to do. And suddenly there was a glimmer of hope. I thought, what would Michael Jackson do? 
So I calmly stared straight ahead. I dropped my arms to my side. I started sliding backwards, and I moonwalked off the bus. <laughs> oh, oh, how I wish that was true. I... <laughs> I wish that I had moonwalked off the bus, but I was only eight years old. I didn't know what a dramatic exit was at that point. <laughs> what I actually did is what any reasonable eight-year-old would do under the circumstances. I turned around and ran right off the bus, much to the surprise of the bus driver and my mother, who was not expecting to see me again so soon. What are you doing? She asked. I'm not going, I said. What do you mean you're not going? There are no seats. I'm not going. And what I meant was, I'm not going to school ever again. In my mind, the social contract had been violated. There were no seats. I was retiring from academia. That simple. <laughs> Fortunately, I had a really great mom, and she said, oh no, you're going. Come on, I'll find you a seat. She grabbed my hand and pulled me back up onto the bus. Yeah, as an eight-year-old kid who had just gotten laughed off the school bus, pretty much the best thing that could happen would be to have your mom get back on the bus <laughs> and try to find a seat for you. And find me a seat she did. She marched down the aisle and started moving people around. You, get up, you slide over, make some space. My son needs to go to school. She plopped me down in the seat, kissed me on the head, and said, have a great first day of school, honey. <laughs> Little did my mom realize that she had sat me down right with the very kids that were making fun of me. And for the rest of that ride to school, they came up with every creative and colorful way they could to make fun of me, my mom, and Michael Jackson. And I just had to sit there and take it, wrapped in my faux red leather blanket of shame. <laughs> when we finally got to school, I got off the bus as quickly as I could. I hustled down the hallway, I found my classroom, I made it to my desk, I tore my jacket off and I stuffed it in the back of my desk. I promised myself that I would never wear it again. I took a deep breath and felt relaxed for the first time in what seemed like hours. I looked around my classroom, I saw my classmates, they were talking with one another, they were saying hello, they were laughing. No one was staring at me, no one was making fun of me, no one was even looking at me. I felt safe, I felt secure, I knew I could start over. I wasn't going to be the weird Michael Jackson jacket kid. <laughs> so I looked down, ready to start my day, I unzipped my backpack to start taking my things out, and then all of a sudden, the panic from the bus returned. My chest got tight, my throat got dry, my face got hot and red because staring back up at me from my backpack were all of my Michael Jackson-themed school supplies. <laughs> yeah. My Michael Jackson notebook, my Michael Jackson homework pad, and my Michael Jackson trapper keeper. <laughs> this ordeal was far from over. Thank you.